Happy Easter, everyone. Yeah. This is such a joy to be with you this morning on Easter morning, Easter Sunday. My name is Tony Katko. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Church. It is such a blessing to be with you on this day of good news, the good news of the Christian faith. Right? The tomb is empty because Jesus is alive, which means that where there was death and where there was darkness and where there was despair, now there is life and light and hope for all the world. Which, by the way, we don't celebrate Easter as this event, the resurrection, that happened in the distant past and no longer really matters. We also don't celebrate the resurrection as if it's something that gives us hope for the distant future but doesn't matter for our lives today. The resurrection also means life is different now. Life is changed here and now. We get to see glimpses of heaven on earth, God's love, God's redeeming all of the world. We get to be a part of that good news. And on Easter Sunday, we see as Jesus rose from the tomb that nothing can separate us from God's love, not even death. God is always with us. That means that God isn't just with you when things are going well. God is also with you in the darkest moments of your life in the times of despair, in the times where you can't see how the world could get any better. God still doesn't abandon us there. And when Jesus died on the cross, that was God dying on the cross to show us that God follows us even into death to bring us new life. Apostle Paul said this in Romans, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God's love is redeeming the world. We get to be a part of what God's doing, and there is nothing that can separate you from God's love. If you don't know that good news for yourself today, or maybe if you just need reminded of it, that might be all you need to hear in this sermon and this morning. God is redeeming the world. You get to be a part of that good news, and nothing can separate you from the love of God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. That could have been the end of the sermon, but we haven't talked about the curtain yet. Back in the Christmas story, when Luke's gospel first began, these angels gave the message that the Savior, Jesus, was going to be born. They gave that message to a group of shepherds out in the field. And these shepherds freaked out. They were terrified. So one of the angels said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. Good news for all people. So why is it then that the gospel of Jesus Christ, is so often preached as good news for some, but not for others. Why is it that this life-changing, transformational, eternal good news of the resurrection is so often talked about like it's salvation for the insiders and everyone else gets left out? This question is more important than ever living in the world today where we know the world is a globalized world, a pluralistic world. We know not everyone is Christian. In fact, Christianity makes up about one-third of the world's population, which means that if you think that Easter is only good news for Christians, then it's not good news for two out of three people living in the world, which also means it's not the good news of Jesus, which the angel said was for all people, which is why we remember the curtain. Back in the crucifixion, as Jesus is dying on the cross, there's an important detail we hear that's easy to miss. This is Luke chapter 23. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now, this may not seem like a big deal to us, but for those original readers, the hearers of this gospel in the first century, to hear that the curtain in the temple was torn in two would have blown their minds. To understand why, we have to understand a little something about how the temple worked back in the first century. If you were Jewish and you lived in the first century before the year 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem was really the center of worship. Now, weekly, regular worship, you would have things in the local synagogues, but whenever you came to make sacrifices, you would take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and go into the temple there. 
Especially this would happen on the larger festivals like Passover when Jesus entered at the beginning of Holy Week. Now this was also called the Second Temple time, Second Temple Judaism, because the first temple that Solomon built was destroyed a long time ago, but the Second Temple was built on top of it. And this Second Temple was much, much larger than the first. It was actually King Herod the Great, the one who was king in Judea when Jesus was born. He was overseeing this large building expansion program for the temple to fit some of the crowds. Scholars estimate that somewhere around 400 thousand people could fit in the temple. 400,000 people. That was a massive structure, especially for that time. But the temple wasn't like a large stadium or one large sanctuary. It was made up of several different courtyards, one inside the next getting closer to the center of the temple. The outermost courtyard, which was by far the, f the largest, this was called the Court of the Gentiles because anyone was allowed in here, even if you weren't Jewish. This court of the Gentiles was where the merchants and the money changers would set up shop because when you went to make sacrifices, it helped to have someone selling some animals you could sacrifice, changing your money, paying, collecting the temple tax. Now, of course, Jesus had something not so great to say about this money changing and business exploiting people in the temple, but that's a story for another sermon. So if you weren't Jewish, if you were a Gentile, the court of Gentiles was as far as you were allowed in the temple. Because as you got closer and closer to the center, things were getting more and more holy. And it was understood that the people of Israel were the chosen people. They were set apart. So since they were closer to God, they were allowed to be closer to the holy place in the temple. So the next area in was the women's court, where all of the Jewish men and women were allowed to be. Now, this was interesting. They had different courtyards within this court. For instance, they had one place for the lepers towards the back. Because Jewish lepers, they were allowed to be part of the community, but they weren't allowed quite as far as everyone else because they were unclean. They had to be by themselves so they didn't contaminate anyone else and defile them. So if you were a Jewish male leper or if you were a Jewish woman, the women's court was as far as you could go. But the Jewish men, they could go one step further into the court of Israel. Now again, we're getting more and more holy the further you get towards the center of the temple. And this court of Israel is where you would bring your animals and pay the priests some money, give the animals to the priests to make sacrifices for you. And then one layer in from the court of Israel for the Jewish men was the court of priests, where guess what? It was only Jewish priests who were allowed in there. This was getting so sacred, so holy, that it was only the professionals that were trusted to be in there. Right? Only the specialized clergy that could be that close to the holy place, that close to God. And within the court of priests, there was the holy place where only certain priests were allowed at certain times because at the end of the holy place was a curtain, a sheet, a veil that separated the holy of holies from the rest of the temple, which they believed this was the most sacred place in the universe, behind that curtain in the Holy of Holies, the closest you could get to God. Now, they believed this, they took this so seriously that only one person was ever allowed past that curtain into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest and only once a year. During Yom Kippur on the Day of Atonement, the high priest could go past that curtain in the Holy of Holies to make a sacrifice. And they took this so seriously, I love this, that the priest, when he took that annual journey into the Holy of Holies, he had to wear a belt with a rope tied to the end because no one was, else was allowed in, even if he were to die. So just in case the high priest were to drop dead behind the curtain, no one else had to go in. They could just pull his body out using the rope. It was so sacred, the closest place that you could get to God. Do you see this elaborate system of hierarchies and rules that are set up in the temple? The courtyard of the Gentiles, and then the women's court, and then the court of Israel, and the court of priests, and then the holy place, and finally behind the curtain, the holy of holies, the holiest place in the entire world. And at each level, there were different barriers. There were different rules for who's in and who's out. For who's clean enough, who is holy and righteous enough to be allowed closer in to the presence of God? So why on earth would I bring a curtain into worship this morning? Because here's the reality. Those barriers, those rules are not something 
that was only practiced by Judaism 2,000 years ago. That's something we are guilty of setting up too. Christianity has been great throughout history of setting up these rules for who's in and who's out, for saying which people are righteous and which people are sinners. We live like there's still a curtain with God hiding behind it, and we guard the access to God. And then if that's true, Christianity and the Bible becomes nothing more than a guide, a path to show you how you can make your way closer and closer to God, closer to the holy places in life. But here's the truth. And if you have been wandering off in your mind, come back. This part is important. This is really the fundamental Lutheran piece of theology that came out of the Reformation. Are you ready for it? There is no way to God period. There is no way to God, which is different than saying there's no way to God except through Jesus Christ if you say the right prayer and believe the right things hard enough and do enough good in the world. No, we believe there is no way for you to get to God. It's God that comes to us, not the other way around. God is not waiting behind a curtain hoping that you'll find your right way back to God. No, the curtain was torn in two when Jesus died because God is out at loose in the world with you and with every other person. By the way, this idea from the Reformation that we don't make our way to God, God comes to us, that's not something that Martin Luther just invented. He just read it from the Bible. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. If you ask most people, what's the big deal about Easter? I bet if you ask this in a children's sermon, what do we celebrate on Easter? You're probably going to hear some variation of Jesus died for us, which is true. Jesus died for us. And by us, of course, I mean all people. Jesus died for all of us. But that's still not actually the good news of Easter Sunday. That's the news of Good Friday. What's important isn't that Jesus died for us, it's that he rose again. If you ask me what the big deal of Easter is, it's that Jesus is alive for us. There is no longer any separation between what's holy, what's sacred, and everyday life for you and me because that temple, that curtain in the temple was torn in two. So if you're tired of trying in vain to get closer to God, if you always feel like you're never good enough, you can never do enough, remember that God's redemption and salvation has already come to you. That gift is yours already. So hear the good news. Jesus is alive and the curtain is torn. If you think your life doesn't matter, if you are worried that you no longer see the wonder and beauty that's around you in everyday life, you've forgotten that everything is sacred. God is with you wherever you are. So hear the good news. Jesus is alive and the curtain is torn. And if you feel trapped in despair, if you can't see that glimmer of light of hope for the world or for your lives, then you've forgotten what Paul said, that nothing, not even death, can separate us from God's love. God is not behind a curtain. God is out loose in the world, redeeming and making all things new. So hear the good news. Jesus is alive and the curtain is torn. Alleluia. Yes. Amen.